Well, thank you for joining us here at Oncology Data Advisor. Uh, my name is Joe Kalis. I'm an ambulatory oncology pharmacist with UC Health in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Wanted to hop on a call today <clears throat> so that I can introduce one of our newest board members for Oncology Data Advisor, have a conversation with him, let him tell us a little bit about what he does, kind of some of the unique perspectives he's got on oncology and supportive care, especially coming from a different specialty. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce the viewers to Dr. Joseph Oropesa. <laughs> Thanks, Joe, for the introduction. Um, you know, like you, like Joe said, uh, my name is Joe Oropesa. I'm an emergency medicine pharmacist here at uh, UC Health Memorial Central Hospital. Um, you know, traditionally, I was trained in in critical care and uh, am board certified in critical care pharmacy, but have over the past couple of years kind of moved my my career and, and passions more to towards emergency medicine and and I'm super happy that to be involved with this and and learn more about uh, the oncology realm from you guys so thank you for having me oh we're we're very excited to have you because you know, we've got the fellows the pharmacists quite a variety of people but oncology can really touch so many disciplines and so many health specialties. So before we kind of dig into that and how your role in the emergency department plays to it, I was hoping you could spend a couple minutes and tell us, well, what what got you interested into critical care and emergency medicine pharmacy? Sure. You know, that's a, that's a tough question. I feel it's somewhat akin to what's your favorite food or song. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things that really interested me in, in originally in critical care. I think part particularly because um, I am somewhat uh, impatient and like to see instant the instant gratification. So if we have somebody who is uh, critically ill um, that needs immediate treatment, a lot of those treatments, you're gonna see the effect of that treatment within seconds of starting it. And, and that allows us to kind of titrate and kind of not to nerd out too much on the, on all the drips over here, but um, it gives you the, I don't know, a sense, gives me a sense of gratification to see sort of that, that instant fix with a lot of those very, very critically ill patients. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, why emergency medicine, which is again, a certainly an interesting question because I am, I did start my career in, in critical care and they and they can seem at times very uh, on, on polar opposite ends of that uh, career stick. Um, however, through my residency training, I had many experiences in the emergency department, um, both during my PGY-1 and PGY-2 years. I would say that those experience, throughout those experiences, I found myself um, attracted to um, I'll, I'll call it the high-paced organized chaos <laughs> that is the emergency <laughs> department. Um, and that, now, as you know, Joe, I'm a very high energy person. I like to be moving around most of my day. And, and I think that the ED provides pharmacists, at least in my opinion, with a unique practice environment. Um, since we are often collaborating with the medical team at the bedside, you know, and, and to rope then the critical care component, you know, we do get to see a lot of critically ill patients that come through the emergency department. So when I had the chance to mix my passion for critical care uh, with everything else that is the ED, um, I found myself very interested in kind of moving my career towards emergency medicine pharmacy and have, and have kind of been there ever since. Ever since. Well, thank you. And, and for the viewers out there, Joe and I are colleagues at the same institution, pretty good friends outside of work. So if there seems a, an extra air of familiarity, that, that's going to be the reason <laughs> behind it. But it, it, it's interesting that you bring up the drips because I know we've had offline conversations where you joke about being able to fix everything with the drip. And I joke about being able to fix everything with a monoclonal <laughs> antibody or a MAB. Uh, but for any viewers out there who might be unfamiliar or just need a refresher on some of the pharmacy pathways, so PGY-1 is postgraduate year one after you, you earn your doctor of pharmacy, kind of often focuses more on internal medicine, general pharmacotherapy. And then if the individual wishes to specialize in something, so oncology for me, critical care and emergency medicine for Joe, you can choose to do a second year. 
So he and I have each completed those board trainings in, in different avenues, different specialties. But yeah, I like to be able to talk to my patients. Joe likes to be able to put them on drips and sedate them. So you've got both <laughs> ends of the spectrum covered here. But I think really what makes what makes Joe Dr. Oropesa, if we want to be formal, such an asset to the, the Oncology Data Advisor Board is a lot of the oncologic emergencies out there. You know, we think of things like febrile neutropenia, hypercalcemia, a malignancy. As we get into the T cell and, and redirection therapies like CAR T cells and bispecific antibodies, there could be things like cytokine release syndrome or others as these agents are given more in the outpatient setting. And Joe and his colleagues in the emergency department are going to be that first line of defense. You know, they might call the clinic first and then get directed there. But I kind of see it as we're all still partners. Well, healthcare is still a team sport. And we really need to have everybody be on the same page. So from, from the emergency medicine standpoint, you know, let's say a patient walks in, you know they're they're in the oncology clinic, they're being treated on active chemotherapy. And we've got they've got a fever. So can you walk us through some of that emergency department thought process for like how you would work up a patient with febrile neutropenia? And then what information from an oncologist might be most helpful for you? Yeah, of course. Um, you know, like you said, this so this would be off I uh for more one of the one of what I would call three categories or three ways that we kind of intersect with, with oncology as more of like a cancer related emergency. Um, you know, the biggest thing with, with neutropenic, neutropenic fever that we're going to be, um, concerned about is, uh, making sure that we're providing adequate coverage right on the front end. Mm -hmm. So, um, things that I'm looking for right on the front end is, are they actually febrile or, you know, is this like a subjective fever that they're coming in with? Um, do we have recent blood counts or how quick can we get those blood counts um, to determine if they are neutropenic at this point? What was their last chemotherapy regimen? Just because pending, and you can talk more in detail about these than I can, but they're, depending on which of their chemo regimen uh, that they're on, that could potentially be associated with a potentially greater risk of developing uh, neutropenic, neutropenic fever as compared to other regimens. And so that can help us determine, oh, if they're on a high risk regimen, maybe we just empirically start treatment prior to this, given that the, the temporal um, aspect of their last, their expected nadir, their, their clinical presentation with us right now, maybe we just start it prior to getting the counts just to make sure that we're covering because what we do know when people do come in, you know, with folks without cancer who come in with septic shock, mm -hmm. uh, we know that every hour of delay of appropriate antibiotic therapy can increase um, uh, mortality by about 7.2% up to up to the first six hours. So it, how much more is that with somebody who has a, a disease state as complicated as cancer? And so there, there is a, a, a sense of true medical emergency to make sure that we're, we're providing adequate care for these folks. And, and it can get very complicated because we also don't want to over-treat them because they're also at risk for treatment-related side effects associated with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be very diligent um, in making sure we're evaluating them appropriately and, and starting them on appropriate therapy. You brought up some good points about, <clears throat> okay, what regimen are they on? And, and mentioning the nadir, it's like the cell counts being at their lowest point. So would it be a helpful piece of information for, for listeners to, you know, they're, say they're calling over a report to the emergency department, you know, mm -hmm. I've got Mrs. Smith, they're on whatever the regimen is. So would it be helpful then for the emergency department to know like when the last treatment was to assess some of that nadir information and then the risk of febrile neutropenia? Yeah, I think, I think it definitely would be, um, okay. you know, it's hard to, um, from my, from my perspective, it's hard for me to speak for all of emergency medicine, particularly sure. because I'm just uh, one little, one small little facet of it. But, you know, throughout my very, my relatively short career, I have noticed one thing that is, that is challenging, particularly with this population, um, and and that is the the documentation component. 
you know, a lot of times when we when these folks come in, um, you know, we don't we have very little information, and sometimes we don't even have access to the records. Per, you know, we're we're very fortunate here at Memorial Central that our primary cancer clinic in town is is attached to our our hospital. So, you know, we we do share medical records with you guys. So we're very fortunate from that aspect. But often, as you probably know, um, in the ED, we're often making this treatment decisions on very, very little information. And mm -hmm. as in, new information comes in, um, those treatment decisions can change literally moment to moment. And so if the more information we can have on the front end, whether it's from a peer to peer conversation, or if you know it's in the medical records, um, the more information that we can have on the front end, you know, where is their cancer? What um, what type of treatment are they on? Is it immunologic? Is it chemotherapy, et cetera? Um, and and when was their last uh, doses given? Was it today? You know, maybe I wouldn't expect them to be as neutropenic if they was if they they're coming directly from the infusion clinic versus oh, it's been about you know seven to ten days since their their chemotherapy and and now they're coming in. Um, and so a lot of that information really helps build that, that acute care sort of clinical picture. So that certainly would be, would be helpful, I think. Okay. Yeah. The more information you can get, you know, especially if they've been treated at a different health system or they're coming, you know, we've got a number of patients here that live several hours away from a hospital mm -hmm. and maybe they've received local care at a more critical access or more rural treatment facility, you know, any records you can get, any information is helpful. And I think too, like some chemotherapies and cancer treatment drugs have a risk of tumor fever or even drug-induced fever as a side effect. And I think of gemcitabine as one, where I'll tell patients, if you spike a fever within 12 hours of getting your dose, it's most likely from the drug. However, we still need to work it up and make sure that that is in fact the case. And, and I like that you brought up some of the points about you know, time directly affecting mortality, especially with the risk of infection. You know, and that brings to mind another oncologic emergency, hypercalcemia of malignancy. You know, I remember giving talks on this particular condition and the, and the statistic of, you know, if, if a patient is hypercalcemic and it's due to their cancer, you know, there's a 50% chance of mortality within 30 days. So it's relying more on just the underlying malignancy being progressive. Mm -hmm. And I think that just underscores the need for everybody to remain collaborative with just because you're in emergency medicine, just because somebody else is oncology. Again, we're all still on that same team. And I think too, again, you brought up the great point of the immunologic therapies and kind of being more of the cutting edge right now. So let's say hypothetical patient comes into the emergency department, you know, they were on a, a checkpoint inhibitor. How does that affect some of the differential workup? I mean, I imagine it would still be helpful to have as much information as you can, but I think mm -hmm. about the immune checkpoint inhibitors and even like some of the T cell agents now being a little bit perhaps more more vague if a patient just presents at the ED. Absolutely. Um, I think I don't think you can def I don't think you can under uh, understate that. <laughs> um, it's it can be very hard, you know. It's particularly with the new um, T cell therapies. You know, a lot of times those patients can present with symptoms that mimic septic shock, um, mm -hmm. and the treatment is very different for septic shock than it is for some of the the T cell related um, toxicity. Um, and you know, in one case, we're giving essentially a, a, a mild immunosuppressant, where the other we want to we want to try to bolster that immune, immune response as much as we can and, and give them, you know, heavy antibiotics and pressures and mm -hmm. stuff. And so um, it can be very, very difficult. And so, you know, again, being able to understand what their disease, where they're at in their disease process, where they're at in their treatment really helps guide the differential in my understanding. Now, I don't do too much of the, the differential diagnosis mm -hmm. side of things, but um, as far as deciding on what treatments, what doses, what, how to approach their care, um, you know, I, I work very closely with those providers to, to collaborate on making those decisions. And so having that information up front can be, can be helpful because then we're not just thinking, oh, this is your generic 
sepsis alert that comes in, we're thinking, okay, this is a sepsis alert in a cancer patient. Is this is this treatment related? Is this directly related to their cancer? Um, it, it expands that that initial clinical approach. Um, you know, I, I I hate to uh, this is this is probably a poor word, but I hate to algorithmize patient mm -hmm. care um, mm -hmm. it, because I think each patient needs to be looked at exactly as they are, and that and I think that that is particularly true with with our oncology population, and so. Um, I would say that it does add a degree of complexity when when we have folks that come in who are on the particularly the immunologic agents because they can present with multiple particularly like the the itises right that that can Absolutely. present as a whole host of different agents they could you know depending on where the itis is whether it's in their liver their their GI tract um, that that's all a different both a different diagnosis track and a different management track, but if we knew that they were on an immune point, then that could that could change. That could quickly change how we're thinking about and how we're approaching the management for that patient. Yeah. Like you mentioned earlier, you're like shifting the plan within minutes of getting new information. Mm -hmm. uh, analogy that that popped into my head. I remember growing up, and even still, when I have spare time now, playing a PC-based strategy game, Age of Empires. <laughs> and, and and as you you know again for anybody in the audience who's not familiar you start off with a small village but the rest of the map is black and you have to go explore to see what else is out there and i'm seeing a lot of parallels with the emergency department where just a patient comes in and like all you know is what's right in front of you unless there's information that's come in from an outside source because so i think you really hit the nail on the head like you could be giving somebody pressors and antibiotics or if you knew that They've been on one of the PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors. We could be looking at high dose steroids, mm -hmm. or if they're on CAR T cell, maybe we're looking at tocilizumab. So it's a very drastic, I think, divide in terms of treating what might present as as a very similar symptom. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think with those things said, we've we've covered a fair bit of ground in terms of how you started in pharmacy to now working in the emergency department and seeing cancer patients. If there was any one thing you would like to leave our, our audience, and again, we've got physicians in training, we've got full-fledged providers, wide variety of people out there, but if there's any one thing you would like them to know about the emergency department as it relates to cancer care, what might that be? Yeah, that is that is a that is a tough question. Again, I'm not sure I'm qualified to speak on behalf of all of emergency care here, um, but, you know, we've talked a lot about the information aspect of things mm -hmm. that is super important. Um, like, again, I can't overstate that. I think if I had to choose anything else, maybe, maybe the importance of reaching, if you're going to be sending somebody into the ED, maybe reaching in and having those, uh, you know, peer to peer conversations on the front end, mm -hmm. um, as opposed to having, you know, an, an unambiguous, an ambiguous patient just show up and say, be like, Oh, I was told to come here. Um, and, uh, you know, providing it, maybe taking those extra steps. Cause a lot of times, you know, emergency medicine is, is very broad. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I hate to use the word general, but, um, whereas oncology is very specific. And so That's maybe if, if a patient comes in and they're on some new study drug, um, chances are even me as the medication expert, hasn't heard of that drug yet. <laughs> so, so if they are on, and particularly if they're on like an experimental treatment, a little bit of uh, taking the extra time to provide some, you know, very brief basic education during that handoff could potentially change the course of care for that patient and the course of their outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that that would be maybe one thing that I would like to, to experience more often. Okay. Well, Dr. Oropesa, sir, thank you for, for your time and joining us on the interview here for the board. Look forward to many happy years working together in the future. Absolutely. Thank you, Gary. Right. Appreciate you. Yep. Yeah, thank you.